So this is my talk. This is called A Brief History of Streams. Um, if you came because of the abstract, I've changed it a little bit since I've submitted, um, and I apologize, but I hope that it will still be interesting to everyone here. Um, my name is Jessica Tran, and you can find me at GitHub at Jessica Quinn, and any other forms of social media presence that you would like to find me on will require some light Googling. So in 1948, Claude Shannon wrote his legendary paper called The Mathematics of Communication. Why was this legendary? Well, for a long time, information had a great challenge, and that challenge was called noise. How could you transfer data across a great distance without losing or skewing the original message? Recall this was back when teletype and telegraphy were still quite vogue. At this time, engineers were proposing different ways to remove noise. Was it to improve the material or transport in which data was traveling? Or maybe it was to change the psychology of how we thought about information and data. In Shannon's paper, he dismissed all these other areas that scientists were studying in one fell swoop and essentially said this about information. Add more redundancy. Prior to Shannon's breakthrough, information was just not an area of study. In fact, Shannon is widely considered to be the father of, to the field of information studies. He said this about information. It's simply the measure of which we overcome uncertainty. So what does this all have to do with node streams? Well, let's just quickly shoot back to the current definition in the documentation. I'm sure you can all read this, but a stream is an abstract interface implemented by various objects in Node, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is an incredibly generic definition, and in its most reductive definition, and I apologize for anyone who disagrees, streams is just a method to transfer data from its source to its destination. So this has everything to do with communication and everything to do with Claude Shannon's work. When we think of the word stream in and of itself, we can think of the ice as it melts from the top of the mountain, moving its winding path to the mouth of the river before reaching its final destination, and has every chance to change, mutate, or transform. It's incredibly in simple to intuit it, this mechanistic fact of matter, the fact of it moves. But information is a different beast. It comes from a Latin to give shape to matter, but how do you move from one channel to another without the loss of integrity? So in this talk, we're gonna talk about the three different computer scientists who influenced where streams are at today and allowed for us to imagine the ecosystem Node.js enjoys because of streams. And we're gonna start with Claude Shannon again. So in the beginning of his seminal essay, he writes, the actual message is one selected from a set of possi possible messages. So what does this necessarily mean? Shannon observed that the English language has a certain predictability. For example, if you have the letter Q, you know definitely that the letter U will follow. Similarly, if you have a longer sequence of consonants, it is highly likely a vowel will follow them. And additionally, it is highly unlikely that an uncommon letter like Z will follow. So here in this passage from a poem, I've marked out a few letters. From our knowledge of the English language and its grammatical structures, we might derive that the single letters missing that follow directly from a consonant is a vowel. And just from our own dictionary, we can probably guess that it comes to this. And we might determine that an often reoccurring three-letter word is the, and we might fill in these blanks. Hence, we get the full message in the full poem. It was Shannon who first used the term bits to describe the set of all possible outcomes given the number of inputs. I.e., given a coin with two equally fair possibilities, there exists log base two outcomes. If you guys took the course, you probably remember. And he also derived this theorem, very incredibly important theorem, that says, let a source have entropy H, bits per symbol, symbol and a channel capacity C. It is possible to encode the output of a source at an average rate of C over H and no greater. And what that means is we have reached the limit of communication when every symbol tells us something new. So let's take this very simple example. We have four characters. They all have a probability of occurrence. A, 0.5, C, 0.25, C, point, half of that, sorry, my math. 
Given a probability of occurrence of characters, A being most likely and C and D being most likely, we can take the prior theorem into an algorithm and derive this set of binary characters. If you guys want to know more, you can probably read the paper, or I can actually say it right now. But basically, it represents the messages or symbols of higher probability by short codes and the lower probability by longer codes. You could run this again and get a compressed set of characters. And this definitely looks familiar to you. It's simply binary. But how did this, this really solve the problem of noise? Say you wanted to transfer a message that said AA, B, A, B, C, but there is an error. And the message became skewed because how the receiver was decoding the message. Well, Shannon observed that there was a redundancy in language. By repeating the message many times, the probability of error could be made very, very small, such as this. So he also stipulated that there is an amount of redundancy that could be made to make the message almost perfect. And what this describes is known as Shannon's limit, the limit of which you could transfer data with the lowest margin of data, an almost perfect message. Any higher, your message breaks down. And while this paper was written in 1948, it was not until 30 years later that scientists really discovered these codes. And those are also known as Gallagher's codes. And that's within 1% of the Shannon's limit. This paper was groundbreaking. Not only did it imagine the logarithmic binary of possibilities, it also described the capacity of a channel to transmit a perfect message in compression. If you want to know just how brilliant he is, there is a great book recently released called A Mind at Play. And additionally, we'll take a fun little break to look at his many inventions called the Shannon machine. Is that going to play? Yes. So this is just a mechanism that's only purpose is to turn itself off. Yes. I find that very goofy and fun. So moving on from Shannon, we get to Melvin Conway which a decade later, in 1958, he brings up the term for the first time, coroutines, while he's working with David Knuth on assembly. He finally published a formal essay on it in 1962 about COBOL's compiler. A coroutine in his paper, he describes as A and B are connected so that A sends items to B, B runs for a little while until it encounters the read command, which means it needs something from A, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very long, very generic. So a very trivial example follows. Say you have a baker who must produce 1,000 cakes. The baker can bake five cakes every half hour. The truck can deliver 10 cakes every half hour. So after the first little bit, five get, cakes get delivered. After a little bit, 10 cakes get delivered. And then after a little time, there's going to be a surplus of cakes and no delivery truck. Furthermore, it's a sunny day, and the cakes are melting. If only there was a way you could pause the break baker so that the truck could have time to return and deliver the cakes with no distress. And that is essentially what a coroutine does. It uses the keyword yield to ask a process to stop. It, it helps separate processes, and when, the co and when the process is ready, it can continue again. Furthermore, they maintain state. So they have been generalized into things such as state machines, back pressure, and pipelines. And coroutines nowadays have faded into the background in favor of multi-threading in terms for multi, multiple processes running. Um, nowadays, it's seeing a resurgence in ECMAScript due to the await sync, which is very cool. Um, but anyways, moving on. We have someone named David Ritchie, as you may all know. David Ritchie, with the influence of Melvin Conway, worked at Bell Labs for many years. Um, during the time, they worked on PDP-1, the first iteration of the time sharing machine, also known as Unix. Melvin Conway kept pushing for coroutines in Unix. He imagined that while redire redirects worked like this, a redirects into B, B redirects into C, et cetera. Is there a way that you can do this more efficiently? And Melvin said, is there a way that we can make non-hierarchical coroutines that operated like arithmetic, i.e. reading from left to right, such that you had something like this? 
He wrote this on a chalkboard. The lab was kind of interesting, but was quickly dismissed because it seemed quite trivial. But with enough pestering, Melvin finally convinced David Ritchie in 1972 in one fateful and feverish night, Ritchie transformed the entire Unix code base to allow for pipes. And the next day, as so the myth goes, everyone was engaged in one-liner orgies that looked like this. So all pipelines, all Unix pipelines, are a generalized coroutine. As one process finishes, another begins. The appearance of pipes elevated the standard in and out design to the status of a philosophy that you all might be familiar with, known as the Unix philosophy. So out of these three computer scientists, we have three very important ideas and philosophies and strides. Redundancy, modularity, and piping. In redundancy and predictability, Shannon basically says to, mu to communicate is to make oneself predictable. With Shannon's breakthrough, you could code any message as a stream of bits without knowledge of its source or its destination. Or as the famous information theorist Davy Fari put it, bits are the universal interface. Next, we have Conway, modular design. Coroutines enabled multiple points of entry for any individual process. It splits complex functionality up into smaller pieces that are easier to write, maintain, and understand, and allowed for extra flow control while maintaining state from switching to process to process. And then finally, we have piping as a philosophy. Again, the standard in and out design, it's seen across most programming languages as operating systems with a single, singular responsibility principle. So no JS streams, what are they? They are generalized pipeline which is kind of a generalized coroutine, which sits on a bed and a foundation for communicating information. We see Node.js streams in a very simple um, HTTP server. HTTPC, HTTP module is in itself a stream. FS is a stream. Listening to Charlie's talk recently, that is now becoming, Winston is now becoming a stream. Johnny5 also runs on Node Zero port, which has become a stream. Streams are everywhere, and also Gulp uses streams. While NPM boasts so many downloads and so many packages, what helps communicate between all these different libraries from different developers and minds? Um, well, I place my bet that the answer is streams. And it's really not without the strides of these figures that I've made over the years that makes imagining nodes existing ecosystem and community of developers possible. And that is my talk. It's very short, but I will have a very nice Q&A. So if anybody has any questions, um, throw them at me. I have much more information on streams, but I decided to disclude them just because I found this a bit more interesting. Mm -hmm.